Now, um, does this look like an easy step or a hard step? Easy. Why easy? I mean, from my easy. perspective or from the Well, I, I mean from nature's perspective. Is it, it easy or hard? It looks hard from the nature's yeah. perspective. Yeah, and why is that? I was thinking. I don't mean from a student's perspective. That's right. It was very straightforward. Um, it looks difficult because it was happy and now it's unhappy, so it probably takes That's some right. energy to get there. How many unhappy species did we create? Two. Yeah, not just one radical. We're not just trying to make one radical, we're trying to make two radicals. So this is where we need the energy okay. from the light. The purpose of the light is to get this first hard step to go. The purpose of the light is for this, uh, to get this first hard step to go. Also, this could also be initiated by heat. And are you familiar with, we can use a delta as a symbol for heat. So either heat or light could be the initiator here. I think it's, it seems like you're already familiar with the idea that this is a symbol for light. Um, I think the reason is um, there's an equation in physics that says that the energy of a photon is Planck's constant times the frequency. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, physicists don't like to use F for frequency. They use the Greek letter nu. This looks like a V, but it's really the Greek letter nu. So this is Planck's constant times the frequency, which is the energy of a light photon. So anyway, this is just a shorthand for light. Um, but probably not visible light, probably ultraviolet light. We need high frequency light because we need the energy from that light. Okay, so that's our initiation step. So what's left in the mix? Well, we've got the chlorines, and we still have this alkane that we haven't used. Now we have to predict what's going to happen next. Well, we can't, it might be hard to predict everything that's going to happen next, but we can at least figure out somebody who's going to be at the head or the tail of an arrow. Who do we know is somebody who's going to react in the next step? Um, I would assume both the chlorine and probably the al it's going to react to the alkene. alkyne. 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 That makes sense. Who, who really wants to react? The radical. Yeah. So what I was getting at is we know these are going to be participating yeah. in the next step because they're unhappy. Yeah. And it wouldn't make sense for them to react with each other because that would just take us back to where we started. Right. So you're right, we're going to have to use our alkane. And now we're simply going to memorize that what's going to happen is that the chlorine is going to steal a hydrogen. So I'm going to have to break out a hydrogen from the mass of the other hydrogens here. Remember that that means the chlorine is going to form a bond to the hydrogen. Well, we learned a few minutes ago that this is how you show bond formation with single-headed arrows. Now, sorry. Are you going from the bond of the hydrogen or the That's hydrogen? right. We saw last time that you never put the tail of an arrow on an atom, so that's a good point. That should have been clear. It's coming from the bond because it's taking one of the electrons from its bond. Now, one thing that we should think about here is what's going to happen to the other electron from this bond? Well, it can't stay in the bond because the bond is disappearing. Is it going to make it negative? Now, remember, charges never change. Oh, that's right. Charges never change with radical mechanisms. Is it going to make it radical? Now, you got it. <laughs> it's going to make it radical. One of the electrons is going to be taken out of the bond and used to make a new bond, and the other electron is going to be taken out of the bond and just put on the atom. So let's see if we can draw the products from that step. Okay. Here's the new chlorine-hydrogen bond. I hope you can read that this is about, this doesn't coming out very clear, but this is supposed to be chlorine, Cl for chlorine. And you figured out that this electron is now going to be turned into a radical. Again, a common mistake would be to forget this arrow. But that would be, it wouldn't make sense to forget this arrow because then the electron would be stranded by itself in a bond that didn't exist anymore. So we have to remember what's going to happen to this. Now we're not changing the charges because here the carbon was sharing two electrons and here it owns one electron. Well, in formal charge land, those give you the same charge. So no charges are going to change. But the carbon does have now a radical where it didn't have before. This is what we call the first propagation step. Propagation step one. Now, which of these two molecules is probably going to react in the next step? The carbon. Because it's got the radical. 
So I'll rewrite it over here. Aha, uh -huh. I know what's going to happen. Yeah? It's going to react with the other chlorine that's unhappy. This one over here? Yeah. That is a good guess. That's not the best thing to look at right now. That's a good guess, but we'll see later why that's not the best thing to look at right now. Instead, it's going to react with another diatomic chlorine. Now, we know that in the first step, one of the diatomic chlorines turned into radicals, but there were billions of them to start with. Oh, right. There were billions of these to start with. And remember, this is a hard step. Only a few of them, even with the light, at any one time are going to be turned into radicals, so there's still plenty of diatomic chlorines left over to react now with our ethyl radical. So now we're going to form another new bond. Chlorine is going to take an electron out of its bond to form this. All right, so let's see if we can finish off writing uh, all the arrows in the intermediate from this step. Those are the correct arrows. I'm glad that you saw that we need this arrow as well. We can't leave this electron stranded here. Now that we have the arrows, we should be able to draw what intermediates we'll get from those arrows. carbons. I'll number them one and two. Uh, maybe I'll start with carbon number two. Let's just say one at a time, what are all the atoms that carbon number two is attached to? The three hydrogens. Is it attached to any other atoms? And the other carbon. Carbon number one. Good. And now let's, num let's uh, list all the atoms that carbon number one is attached to. Uh, chlorine. Anything else? Mm, two yeah. Okay. Now, I think the mistake you made with your first attempt is that you separated these two carbons. Yeah, I do that a lot. Yeah, you separated those two carbons. Yeah, a lot of students would do that. And the, how do we know not to do that? Because we have to remember that arrows are our masters. The arrows tell us what to do. If an arrow does not tell you to make a change, you can't make the change. What you were doing is you were breaking this bond between these two carbons, but there's no arrows coming from this bond. So how can we break it? Okay, because see, above we broke the hydrogen off, but that's because we totally broke that bond. Notice that here, we were breaking this bond because there were actually arrows right, okay. showing what happened to the electrons in this bond. So it's okay to break a bond, but only if the arrows tell you to break a bond. And this is the one thing about radical arrows that definitely is also true for non-radical arrows. And that's, you're definitely right, that's a huge mistake that students make. Students tend to say, oh, this carbon is attaching here, and they forget to bring along the rest of the game. Um, they just detach it, and the reason is they don't really trust the arrows. They're just trying to draw what feels good, or what they kind of remember having seen before. We have to get in the habit of simply going one atom at a time, and only making the changes that the arrows tell us to make. The idea is, even if somebody had never seen this reaction before, as long as they're given the arrows, they should be able to write the right product. The arrows tell you what to do. So, when do you break a covalent bond? When the arrows tell you to break it. And if the arrows don't tell you to break a bond, you can't break it, which means you can't attach those two things. That seems trivial, but that's a source of a lot of mistakes that students make. That's a source of a lot of mistakes in SN2 and SN1 as well, so we'll probably come back to that. All right, so these are still all um, tied together. Um, this bond is breaking, because we got arrows coming from it. And we got a new radical chlorine here. This is called propagation step two. Interesting now. Well, first of all, which of these is going to react in the next step? The radical chlorine. Yeah, this is happy, so it's probably not going to react again. Notice that we started with a boring ethane molecule, but now we have a chloromethane molecule. So this is the, pro the main product we were trying to get. Now, what's going to happen to this chlorine? Well, this is what you might not have expected. 
Notice how the, the product of propagation step two is a chlorine radical. But what was the starting material for propagation step one? A chlorine radical. So in fact, all we're going to do now is go back and do another propagation step one. This chlorine over here is going to go back and do another of these steps. It's going to take one of the unreacted ethanes and react with it. Okay. That will give you an ethyl radical. And then that ethyl radical will take one of the unreacted chlorines and give us a chlorine radical. But then it just keeps going. That's right. Have you heard the term? This is called a chain mechanism. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why it's called a chain mechanism. It's a chain reaction. That is, these two steps just keep repeating and propagating over and over. So this really is quite different from the alkene reactions that we saw. The alkene reactions that we saw were not chain reactions. They kind of happened once, and that was it. But here, we keep taking the product from propagation step two and using it as the starting material for another cycle of propagation step one. 